as Dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Alberta. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event for Alumni Week 2020. To our esteemed alumni, you are an integral part of our community. Thank you for supporting our students, the faculty, and for continuing to stay engaged with us. There were many classes set to celebrate reunion milestones this fall that have now been postponed until next year, including the class of 1955, who are celebrating their 65th reunion. Even though we cannot welcome you back to campus in person this year, we are grateful for your contributions to the profession of pharmacy pharmaceutical sciences, and we are excited to give you a glimpse of the amazing work being done by the faculty, but by our researchers and students. We hope you enjoy learning more about the innovative, life-saving research at your alma mater. We look forward to when we can welcome you back on campus again soon. Enjoy. My name is Afsane Lavasanifar and I am a full professor in the Pharmaceutical Sciences Division of the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, I teach pharmaceutics and my area of research is also in pharmaceutics and drug delivery with particular interest in nanomedicine for cancer therapy and inflammatory conditions. In my lab, actually, we start uh, from synthesis of all our own materials that we are going to use. So we have a lab that is devoted into chemical synthesis. Uh, we then um, take those materials that we have synthesized and make um, nanoparticles, materials in nanometer size range from them, and load drugs into those um, nanomaterials. And we also test them in my lab in the cells uh, outside the body. And so we have another uh, area that is devoted to cell studies. And then uh, we bring it into the animal and also do animal studies on different disease models. So you can see that the areas that we cover in my lab is very broad. And we start from the chemical synthesis and we end up uh, with animal studies. So um, every day in normal life, not in today's situation, uh, when we come to the university, I start by uh, basically looking at uh, what I have to accomplish on that day. I start with basically my to-do list and that uh, to-do list involves uh, different um, areas like I may be working on a paper, I may be working on a grant proposal and um, I may be working on my slides for teaching and things like that. I usually pay a visit uh, to the lab and uh, talk to my students and my other research staff and we try to troubleshoot any um, basically problems that they may have in the research and go through their results uh, from previous day or previous week. We usually have a group meeting every week and uh, everyone get to present their results in that group meeting and we discuss the results and try to find ways to make the research uh, more optimized and um, basically guide the students to be able to get to their goals uh, in a more smooth way. Uh, my lab is also engaged uh, with uh, different multidisciplinary projects around University of Alberta campus. We have collaborative research with uh, Cross Cancer Institute, Faculty of Medicine, and uh, also uh, Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science. I also have um, collaborative research um, with different researchers around uh, Canada. Um, part, I am part of a grant. Um, um, that has researchers involved from University of Victoria, uh, University of Concordia, University of Toronto, and um, also have collaborative research with different institutions in US, uh, including um, University of uh, Texas in Houston, uh, as well as University of Wisconsin, and um, University of um, 
Pennsylvania. Um, and um, so I am really um, proud of uh, this collaborative and multidisciplinary research we do. And our intention is to get take advantage of uh, the know-how and the best uh, experts in different fields uh, to make our research more fruitful and um, at the end of the day make the life of um, the patients better. So being a pharmacist by training you get to see a lot of patients and at times you will realize that uh, patients will suffer from the side effects of treatment uh, maybe even more than the disease itself. So it has been uh, my goal to basically uh, try to solve this problem and uh, help uh, medicine work better with the side effects in patients. So that has been the general goal that has uh, led me into this uh, area of research. And personally, I have always been uh, interested in uh, research and um, the curiosity and uh, new developments and I, I have always been um, very interested in finding new things and that that's what gets me excited um, you know, when we can solve a problem in the lab and um, be able to answer questions and at the end of the day maybe we can um, affect the lives of um, patients and in a broader sense I'm also very interested in this discipline and this um, career because of the aspects in training of uh, future scientists and training of future pharmacists. So that is uh, another aspect that keeps me going and also makes me very interested in this uh, career. Um, I like to see my trainees get um, good jobs, succeed in their lives and also affect the lives of others. All right, hello, so my name is John Usher. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. After doing this research um, for about 15 years now, uh, our, our at least the research program uh, was recently recognized and I am now currently also tier two Canada research chair uh, in the uh, general thematic area of pharmacotherapy of energy metabolism in obesity, what we have discovered and others have discovered is that the organs in our body and the way they burn fuel, and so when I say fuel, I mean things like sugar, carbohydrates, um, which is uh, primarily glucose or uh, fat, the fat in our diets. Those are the primary two fuels that are, are uh, the organs or the cells in our body burn uh, to produce energy so that we can do our day. Um, and so those processes um, malfunction in obesity in our various organs. Uh, the ones that my lab is uh, studying are uh, the heart, skeletal muscle, and liver. Um, and we believe that the processes that cause the burning of these fuels to malfunction in obesity in your heart or in your muscle, um, that those processes that malfunction are actually uh, a major um, player in causing the elevations in blood sugar, um, that someone with obesity uh, that becomes pre-diabetic and eventually type 2 diabetic, uh, that that's actually a root cause of that whole process. And then even following that, um, as your heart malfunctions in its ability to burn fuel, that that is also a root cause in why people with obesity type 2 diabetes are also more likely to develop heart disease. And so as a pharmacologist, uh, we are very interested in um, by, under, like, by using um, mouse genetics and uh, integrative physiology and pharmacology approaches, uh, we believe if we identify what is the molecular or cellular reason in, in your heart or your muscle for why your ability, for why the ability of your heart to burn sugar or fat, or your muscle's ability to burn sugar or fat, if, if that malfunctions, um, if we understand that process, if we can then develop a drug that can reverse that process, can we then improve blood sugar control in people who are obese or diabetic, or reduce the risk of heart disease, or, or prevent the worsening of heart disease in someone who is also obese or diabetic.
Uh, this is our um, mouse ultrasound echocardiography machine. We have here Dr. Keshav Gopal. I like to call him our resident mouse cardiologist. <laughs> um, in our lab, we're very interested in studying how obesity and diabetes increase the risk of heart disease. Um, and you know how that might involve malfunctioning, um, the fuel burning in, in the heart. And so uh, Dr. Gopal here uses this ultrasound machine in our obese diabetic animals and he is able to look at the, uh, the actual walls in your heart, how thick they are, how thin they are, and how well they're actually contracting the blood. Um, and so by looking at that and analyzing it, we can actually see if our interventions that alter fuel metabolism might improve the way the heart uh, pumps blood to the rest of the body. So this is known as M-mode echocardiography, where you look at the, uh, the actual wall measurements and how the heart is pumping blood um, throughout the rest of the body. Uh, we can also use something known as tissue doppler, uh, and that actually allows us to look at how well the heart relaxes. And so in diabetes, actually we've now, um, there's more and more evidence coming out that people with diabetes, rather than having problems with how well their heart pumps blood, they also have very severe problems with how their heart relaxes between pumps. And so some of the work we're doing in our lab is actually seeing how improving the way the heart burns fuel actually improves the ability of the heart to relax in people with obesity and diabetes. For me personally, the day-to-day -day activity hasn't changed too much. I mean, it's a little bit more work from home, um, but in working from home versus working from here, uh, I guess the day-to-day -day living is uh, a little boring in the sense that I'm kind of always in front of computer screen for the most part. So uh, I mean most of my day-to-day uh, -day activity in managing running the research lab is uh, reading research papers, writing papers, writing grants, you know kind of thinking of new exciting experiments for us to try and further figure out or you know further understand um, why a fuel burning process might malfunction in the heart or the muscle. Um, so, you know, the real exciting stuff is more what the trainees in the lab are doing because they're the ones on the bench, um, you know, working with the cells or working with the animals and identifying uh, the actual molecular or cellular changes that cause these processes to malfunction. Whereas, uh, you know, my, my role is kind of the overseer of the research program is really just constantly being in front of the computer screen and thinking of new ideas and new approaches for us to uh, to answer the questions we're asking and to uh, write grants to excite uh, you know, external funders and government agencies uh, to support our lab with the, um, with the external operating funds so that we can, so all the hardworking trainees in the lab uh, can actually carry out the research that we want to do that will help us you know, ultimately um, discover what might be the best way to uh, find a, a druggable approach to correct malfunctions in fuel burning in people who would be so diabetic. If you, know, if you asked me 20 years ago what I was planning on doing, um, I would not have predicted this future for myself, but I'm very happy that this is the future that I have you know, um, uh, pursued and, and now like what my life actually is. And I absolutely love it, uh, you know, academic freedom, to be in a situation where if I think something is interesting, as long as I feel like I can ask a good question to address, you know, to answer the question that we have, or design a good experiment to address it, and, you know, if there's a model for me to use to study it, uh, I can kind of do, for the most part, anything that I want to do. And so I think that's like really, really cool and awesome. And so it just, uh, it makes every day, like even though my life is looking in front of a computer screen and like thinking of ideas and like writing papers and grants, it's uh, like awesome. I, I love every minute. I'm Andrew McIsaac and I'm Assistant Dean Advancement in the faculty and I lead our Translational Research Institute uh, Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation. API is an institute that enables the faculty to work uh, on real-world projects um, related to putting drugs on the market or uh, developing new innovations that will uh, enable better therapies. Um, we work closely on projects um, that range from manufacturing drugs uh, to testing their stability to uh, looking at um, 
new compounds and substances that might have an effect in determining if, if they're suitable for drug development. Uh, the model we work in uses a lot of students and uh, postdoctoral fellows working on projects hand in hand with uh, industry professionals so they get that first hand um, opportunity to work in real world drug development. Uh, we work with a lot of faculty members within the faculty um, with their various subject matter expertise lending to different projects. Uh, one of the core facilities we work with uh, is a drug development and innovation center uh, run by Dr. Reimar Lohenberg. A lot of the work that they do is very much what API is focused on um, and so we at any given time have somewhere between five and ten projects on the go um, within that lab alone. So there's a lot of work that's happening uh, within the faculty here uh, and really what we're looking to do uh, is leverage the expertise within the pharmaceutical sciences uh, to build the life sciences industry here in Alberta and provide really unique opportunities for our students to learn on real world projects as well as potentially bring uh, life-saving uh, discoveries to the point where they're actually able to, to go and affect the lives of patients. One of the big projects that we undertook um, uh, since COVID-19 started uh, is looking at how we can help with some of the drug shortages that are happening in, uh, in Canada. As many people know, there has been drug shortages over the past 10 years in a whole wide variety of drugs and pharmacists can spend up to 20% of their time tracking down the drugs they need for their patients. Um, so we saw that as a big opportunity for us to, to come in and, and help with this uh, critical challenge, especially when supply chains became disrupted with COVID-19. Um, so generally, the drugs that we make within the, our facilities are made for uh, clinical trials and clinical research, uh, but we do have the capability to, to make drugs that can go into, into patients. Um, and so we took that clinical trial expertise and are now working on uh, building a larger scale supply chain within Canada for some of the key medicines that are needed. Um, uh, we're working with a group of uh, chemical producers and then uh, our facilities here on campus as well as uh, facilities elsewhere in Edmonton um, to manufacture propofol, which is one of the drugs needed to put patients on ventilators, uh, as well as looking at a number of other um, drugs that are on the Health Canada shortage list uh, to see if we can develop uh, capacity here within Canada to ensure that there's no shortages, uh, particularly as COVID-19 increases uh, around the world and uh, we end up with wildly fluctuating demand as well as um, challenges in, in getting it imported to the country. Uh, one of the unique things about API is the opportunities that students get uh, when they're working with us. Um, we've had PharmD students who have done uh, analysis of clinical trial data from large pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, done work for the cannabis industry for folks who are doing clinical research in that area, and have really gotten a, a unique opportunity to work in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, so we've got biostatisticians from other faculties who are engaged in projects with us, uh, where we have uh, PharmD students doing pharmacokinetic modeling. Um, we also have a lot of opportunities to work with faculties like the Faculty of Science where their chemistry um, folks uh, work on projects that we then uh, move to the point where it's uh, moving into medicinal chemistry. Um, some of the students that have worked on our programs with us have been able to go on exchanges down to uh, the states or elsewhere for internships with, with pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we've uh, attracted uh, folks who have been able to get jobs in the industry afterwards because they've gotten this first-hand um, experience working in the pharmaceutical industry. A lot of times academic labs tend to, tend to focus on academic um, research, which is similar to drug development research, but it differs in terms of what's driving the objectives. In drug development research, you're really focused on um, coming up with the scientific case uh, that a drug is safe and effective uh, so you can move forward uh, with regulatory approvals. Um, whereas in scientific research, you're looking much more broadly and sort of chasing these open questions. Um, and so we're able to give that uh, drug development research type uh, translational lens for students during their education. And in many cases, the, the stuff that they work on ends up being in patients at one time. 
One of the unique things that we're trying to achieve with API uh, is coming up with a new industry that can really provide a lot of the high paying jobs uh, and high standard of living that we found previously in something like oil and gas. Uh, we really see pharmaceutical sciences as a big attractor for the life sciences industry to the province. Um, and if we can do a good job of training students and developing this expertise, our hope is we can attract uh, large-scale projects with industry, um, new pharmaceutical companies, spin-offs that come from the university here, staying within uh, the province and continuing to grow, provide jobs for pharmacists, chemists, uh, lab techs, you name it. Uh, there's a huge variety of positions within pharmaceutical companies. Um, and so our hope is to, to really drive that industry and provide it as a really viable career path for our jobs here within Alberta. Hi, I'm Dr. Nashi Yixel and I'm a professor here at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Primary School Sciences. My clinical and research areas are in women's health and osteoporosis. My research is primarily focused in two clinical health research areas. One, to improve access and care for sexual and reproductive health and rights, also known as SRHR, specifically with contraception and menopause, and two, to improve care for osteoporosis patients. My role at the faculty includes the traditional academic role, such as teaching, research, scholarly activity, and uh, service. I also practice in a couple of clinics. Uh, one is the menopause clinic at the Lois Hole Hospital, and in alternating weeks, I practice at the multidisciplinary bone health clinic at the K Clinic at the University of Alberta. I am a clinician researcher, and what's really important is for me to integrate my clinical practice with my research. I believe that many clinical questions lead to research questions, and therefore it's really important for me to maintain a practice so I can uh, integrate both clinical and research together. Some examples of this include we're currently developing a practice tool for pharmacists for assessing and initiating combined hormonal contraceptives and with other colleagues of mine including Dr. Christine Hughes and Dr. Terry Schindrel as well as another graduate student Javiera we have just finished a survey looking at SRHR practices across Alberta. An example of a clinical research project we did in menopause was with a PhD student of mine Tasman CM and we developed a patient decision aid to help women decide on hormone therapy and these are women who have had an early surgical menopause for example a menopause before the age of 45 years. I've also previously completed studies looking at screening of osteoporosis in community pharmacies and we're currently looking at assessing and managing medication-induced osteoporosis in the future. Around the time of legalization of cannabis, we had also completed another study looking at websites that promoted cannabis. And what we found was that the claims that were made on these websites overlapped a lot with menopausal symptoms. And the most frequent claims included anxiety, sleep, uh, as well as pain. Unfortunately, there is very little evidence with the use of cannabis in menopause, but we do know that women are using it. This has led to our current study. And the purpose of our study is to characterize the use of cannabis in women and to get their perspectives. We want to go directly to women to understand if they are using cannabis for menopausal symptoms, which symptoms they are using cannabis for, and what their experiences have been and their perspectives on cannabis for menopause. My name is Kasha Babin. I'm a current graduate student doing my master's degree with the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And I'm also a graduate from the Bridging PharmD program from the class of 2018. My supervisor is Dr. Yuxil and we are looking at cannabis use in menopause. Uh, the whole purpose of our project is to go directly to patients themselves or women and to identify and understand if cannabis is being used for the treatment of menopausal symptoms. My research is focused at going directly to women to see if they are using cannabis in menopause. Currently, the evidence is quite mixed whether or not, and we want to address this by establishing a knowledge base to 
inform future research projects and also the development of tools that can be applied by clinicians in their practice. We're hoping to fill the current gap in knowledge um, with our research by applying both quantitative and qualitative techniques in a mixed methods study. First, we'll be doing a survey within Alberta women over the age of 35 to see if and how cannabis is being used in menopause. After the survey, we'll be going to women and doing one-on-one -on -one interviews to explore their experiences with cannabis use, whether they've previously used cannabis for symptom control or are currently using it, in order to develop a rich description on current use habits within Alberta. Our survey will be released early this fall and will be made publicly available to be taken by any woman over the age of 35 that currently resides in Alberta. We hope to have findings available by early spring. Not only am I a graduate student, I'm also a licensed pharmacist here in Edmonton and I'm able to work um, as a pharmacist while completing my master's degree. I find the two really a great experience because not only can I provide patient care and work as a pharmacist, but I'm allowed to, in parallel, explore um, future areas of research and really take one step further in answering questions in a different way and definitely looking in the future at how we can help um, our patients manage their symptoms better or their conditions in general. This work is really important to us because we are going directly to women to ask about their experiences and their perspectives of with cannabis in menopause. We hope to be able to share our findings with women to be able to support them, especially women who are asking questions about cannabis and menopause or if they're struggling with menopausal symptoms. Strategies can include uh, patient education material or public awareness uh, um, strategies that we can look at in, in the future. We also want to bring back our research to clinicians to support them in their practice. We can bring back this information to the clinic I practice in, to other healthcare professionals who are looking after menopausal women, or to professional uh, organizations that advocate for women. I have seen women who struggle with basal motor symptoms, night sweats that wake them up at night, sleep issues, and mood issues uh, such as anxiety, irritability or, or depression even. And so I have become passionate about doing research in this area because I realize that we do need to support these women so that they are cared for and um, that we also provide the tools to help either educate and inform women of their options and uh, we want to make sure they're evidence-based so they're based on the literature to support what we're saying to them and um, that's sort of where I've got my passion from is seeing the women, talking to the women, the types of questions I get every day. And, uh, you know, it's just something that I am very happy to be working in this area.